Father, and bless Joe as he continues to move us forward here. Amen. You enjoying this? I, I mean, are you thankful for it? I mean, you are, you're getting what, about a, about a quarter of a semester of a college course right now. How many of you are feeling that? Keep taking good notes, and thank you for presenting us with the notes that make it easy to follow. Let's turn to session number two here. I'd like to talk about common pro-gay arguments we are likely to hear. I don't think argument is a dirty word. An argument is simply a position put forward with the idea of either persuading or correcting. I do not then resent it if someone says, I have an argument with what you say or what you believe. It does not mean we're entering into contention it means at least we are entering into discussion. We are certainly likely to hear pro-gay arguments once we have identified ourselves as people who hold what I call a traditionalist position versus a revisionist position, the two words being self-explanatory, the traditionalist position meaning I believe in the traditional viewpoint that the sexual union is meant to occur within the context of monogamous heterosexual marriage, the revisionist position being we have expanded our understanding of normal and moral and thereby we have revised it. Of course, context and content both play into all conversations, don't they? We cannot divorce context from our conversations because the context of the conversation largely determines, not completely, but largely, how well the content is received. Now, just for example, how would you feel if somebody said to you, well, you look uglier than dirt today? old paunchy fogey. <laughs> now see, one of my best friends said that to me just three weeks ago. <laughs> I loved it. I mean, <laughs> we go back 30 years, we can talk to each other that way. And men, as you know, we're just brilliant. <laughs> we love each other by insulting each other speaks to our high intelligence. This is how we love one another. And when men are close, <laughs> they, they throw the barbs. And it's a celebration of closeness and the privilege that comes with closeness. So I was delighted when my good friend greeted me that way because of the context of our relationship. I really haven't met most of you. I'm not at all sure I would be delighted <laughs> if we met in the foyer and you greeted me that way. It may well be true, I wouldn't argue it, I'm just saying I don't think I would like it very much. Context surely plays into it, doesn't it? No wonder then a Samaritan female was flabbergasted that a Hebrew male came to her and said, will you give me some water? Her first remark, in fact, spoke to that when she said, you're Jewish, I'm Samaritan, and we're talking? Because what was the context? Tension. Long-standing tensions between Hebrews and Samaritans. And who knows what else? I mean, it's entirely possible that in addition to what she knew to be true traditionally about the history of Samaritans and Jews, she herself may have had very bad experiences with Hebrews. We don't know that. I'm just speculating, but I'm only saying it's entirely possible. So based on both her experience and her understanding of the two groups, she had a preconceived idea of this Hebrew male who came up to her and said, may I have something to drink? 
The context of our conversation includes the tensions between conservative born-again believers who hold up a high view of Scripture and the traditional view of sexuality and the homosexual individual. And in my experience, both parties come into the conversation with preconceived ideas, some of them accurate, some of them not. And so that context must be considered when I approach someone who is homosexual as a traditionalist, I must realize that even before the content begins, there is probably a tension to be penetrated. Now, I don't want to shy away from the conversation because of that. I simply want to realize it is there. And I would like to, by my respect, my affection, my interest in the individual in his totality, not just his sexuality, I would like to challenge some of the preconceived ideas he or she has about me because of the context of our conversation. And it probably wouldn't hurt me to be challenged as well in my understanding of that individual as a homosexual because people are relentlessly unique, aren't they? Oh, I, what do I know about that person? Very little, very little. So we cannot divorce the context from the conversation, but we will, that said, focus on content in this session. Uh, when, whenever you're presented then with an argument or a challenging statement, you can challenge both the accuracy and the implication of the argument. And these are both very important. Challenge both the accuracy of the argument and the implication of the argument. What specifically does the argument propose and what in general does the argument imply? Those are usually two very, very different things. So with that in mind, let's look at five common pro-gay positioning statements we are likely to hear. The first is probably the commonest, and you've no doubt heard it. Homosexuality is inborn. People are born gay. It's been proven, in fact. Everybody knows that. The implication being, of course, if homosexuality is inborn, it must be natural, it must even be God ordained. Homosexuality has been proven to be unborn. This is a relatively new concept. It wasn't until the early 1990s, uh, specifically late 1991, when studies began to be uh, reported by scientists. Uh, or medical doctors who had done research either into uh, twins or brain structures, comparing the brain structure of a heterosexual to a homosexual, and concluding that there is evidence that there are either biological or genetic or both differences between homosexual people and heterosexual people. And from where I'm sitting, that began an escalation which probably didn't have to happen, in which a lot of believers felt threatened, like, oh no, wait a minute. If you say homosexuality is inborn, that would somehow concede the moral issue, because if it's inborn, then I'm going to have to admit it's normal, so no. That can't be right. Those studies must be wrong. And on the other end, the pro-gay apologist was basically falling into the same trap, saying if we can prove it's inborn, we can thereby prove that it is normal. And so ever since then, there, there has been an escalation between the two camps, arguing over whether or not it has been conclusively proven that homosexuality is inborn. Well, first you can challenge the accuracy of the claim, because as we speak, at least this November night of 2015, 
inborn studies have not been successfully replicated. That is to say, every year a handful of studies are released, and this has been true since really 1991, in which some new experiment or research has been done indicating that homosexuality may be inborn, but then the research or the experiment is not replicated in a different environment, and so it all remains inconclusive. In fact, the inborn studies or theories have not been universally embraced by the scientific community. Certainly there are very qualified scientists, doctors, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, who believe that, yes, homosexuality is inborn. They are convinced that that is true. But that is not a universal conviction. The way people talk, you'd think it was, but I think you know how this plays out. When something gets into the echo chamber, you know what I mean. It's, it, it goes viral on the internet, and all the talking heads are saying it, and the teachers are saying it, and everybody seems to say it. By the sheer volume of people who say it's so, the public begins to think, oh, well, must be true then. Because everybody in the know seems to believe it. But really, the American Psychiatric Association, which holds a very, I dare say, aggressive pro-gay viewpoint, uh, has said about this, and I quote, there is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops orientation. No findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. In fact, I happen to believe a very reasonable consensus is growing that acknowledges there are probably a cluster of influences combining to create what we call the homosexual orientation or the homosexual condition or attraction, however you phrase it. Uh, I am really not at all convinced people are born homosexual. I'm, I'm really not. I think it is entirely possible that some people are born with a personality structure which is more susceptible to homosexuality if other variables come into play. So that could, just speculating, account for the fact that uh, I have two brothers, two older brothers, raised by the same father I was raised by, raised in the same home environment I was raised in. To my knowledge, neither of my brothers have ever experienced any homosexual attractions. Why did I? It's entirely possible that the personality structure I have was more susceptible to acquiring homosexual desires when certain other environmental factors came into play as opposed to my brothers who did not have that same structure. So I think we will probably never come up with one definitive reason people become homosexual. There are some theories, for example, a very popular one um, among many conservative theorists is the family triad theory in which um, a boy is much closer to his mother than his father, has an unsatisfactory relationship with his father, develops a deep yearning for a father's love which is not satisfied, and as that boy hits puberty, that yearning becomes sexualized, hence you have homosexuality. I don't know. may be true. It may be. I dare say no one theory, though, will apply to all people. Now, I've known many homosexual men who fit that pattern to a T. They really do. But I've also known homosexual men who had wonderful relationships with their dads and didn't experience any sense of not being loved by the main man in their life, and yet they developed homosexual feelings. So I don't think any one theory will apply to all people, including the inborn theory. So at this point, we can still challenge the accuracy of the claim by pointing out that, you know, 
there really is not a universal consensus that homosexuality is inborn. That is broadly believed. That doesn't make it true. The jury is still out. The proof is not conclusive, not by any means. My opinion, it probably never will be. I would be very surprised if someday a scientist discovers a gay gene or a verifiable biological explanation for homosexuality. I doubt that that is going to happen. Ah, uh, but what if it did? What if tomorrow morning we wake up and there it is on CNN? Gay gene identified, proof positive, homosexuals are born that way. Inarguable evidence, it's an inborn condition. What would it tell us other than what we already know? We are born in sin. And then that, to me, is the real issue, which is why I don't butt heads too much with people over the inborn theory. If I'm talking to someone who says, I was born this way, I might gently say, well, you, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the jury's out on that. We don't really have proof. But hey, maybe you were, maybe you weren't. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Well, the real question is, do we determine whether something is right or wrong by its origins? No, we don't. We look at the tendency itself and assess it in light of our worldview, not in light of what caused it. So, even if it were inborn, we can challenge the implication of the claim, because the implication of the claim is, if it's inborn, it must be right. To which I would respond, in the interest of reasoning with someone, oh, come on, several unhealthy conditions may be inborn. Which really is true, by the way. I mean, there's a, a lot of evidence out there that alcoholism and chemical dependency, uh, it's a condition often acquired in life because someone is born with what we call the addictive personality. And these problems do tend to run in families, so there really may be a genetic component to that. There's been some very good research done um, by a number of scientists and uh, doctors indicating a very possible genetic link to addictive behavior. There are uh, scientists who are recognizing a possible genetic component to violence. That some people may really be born with inborn violent tendencies, strong ones. And in some cases, attorneys are even making defense cases based on that. Your Honor, my client couldn't help it. He's got the violence gene. <laughs> you know? Depression may be something people are born with a susceptibility to. I read an article about 20 years ago in Time magazine. It was their cover story. I just loved it. The cover said, adultery. It may be in our genes. And the author was suggesting that men are genetically wired for either promiscuity or polygamy. And unreasonable women are trying to rope us into monogamy when our genetic structure compels us to have many different partners. And, and the obvious logical question is, oh, come on, where does all of this end, okay? Okay. Even if all of that is true, and I'm not saying it is, we still are free will agents, aren't we? That is to say, we still have the capacity to say yes or no to our inclinations, no matter what created the inclinations in the first place. This can be an important point in dealing with someone who says, I'm gay and Christian. I'm a born-again believer, but I have embraced being homosexual because I realize I was born that way, and if I was born that way, God must have made me that way. Well, no. No, one of the great challenges you and I have as disciples is the challenge of taking up the cross and applying it to the parts of life where it is indeed the cross. Many of the sacrifices we say we make as Christians are not very profound, are they? But there are times the cross is applied to an area of life so deep, so potent, that it really does feel like exactly what the cross, I suppose, is supposed to feel like, death. We die to something very 
profoundly natural to us. And this is true, I'm sure, in many areas of life. I am grateful for many changes God has brought about in my life. There are many changes which I still anticipate, I still hunger for. There are many old urges still there in my flesh. In fact, as I hope to relate in a few minutes when we get to the change question, whatever we repent of does not make our flesh any better. We simply deal with the flesh in a different way. So when people say, Joe, did you change? Yes, but my flesh didn't get better. It is still that Adamic carcass which must be crucified regularly. And there are many deeply ingrained tendencies that feel downright inborn to me. Now my temper, praise God, is much more manageable than it used to be. And I am much less likely to explode than I used to be. I unfortunately suffer with a very carnal, ungodly tendency when I am driving and somebody cuts me off. <laughs> the most natural thing for me to do would be to, you know, wave uh, to them. And I don't. I don't do that. I never do that. Never. But I cannot with any integrity say I don't want to. And there are times I will literally grab my hand and say, no. And that's what Christian bumper stickers are for. <laughs> now let me be even more ridiculous than usual. Could you imagine me saying, you know, I was born with the desire to make that gesture. I mean, I've had it since I was a little boy. Ever since I can remember, I've been doing that. To me. Every time I was mad, that's what I did. I tried to stop. I got spanked for it. I got sent to the principal. I became a Christian, and I prayed for God to take away all desire for me to make that gesture. And I stopped the behavior, but the desire never left me. In fact, every year it seems stronger in me. It seems natural to me. I went to counseling for it. I had the elders of the church lay hands on me and pray that I would be delivered from it. I read the books about it. I went to conferences about it. I tried shock treatment for it. And nothing changed my natural inclination to make that gesture. Therefore, I have concluded God created that desire in me. I was born to greet people with that particular salute. It's who I am. I'm going to stop denying who I am. I'm going to be true to who I am. I'm out of the closet. Okay, now I am being a jerk because there is, of course, a huge difference between making an obscene gesture and all the complexity of sexual desire. But the principle is the same, really, it is. Uh, so the, the question no longer becomes, what is someone born with? We can concede the possibility that homosexuality is inborn without sacrificing one shred of biblical integrity because we are born in sin, and so it is entirely possible, not likely, probably will never be proven, but I will concede the possibility that that is an inborn condition. But the question does not become, how was somebody born, but rather, is the thing in and of itself natural? Inborn, therefore, does not mean normal, nor does it mean God-ordained, which leads to a second very common argument, I can't change. I can't change. Homosexuality is immutable. You will no doubt, if you discuss this with people, hear about the controversies over whether or not a homosexual can ever truly change and be converted into a heterosexual person. In California, 
It is now illegal to offer professional counseling to an adolescent if the counseling is designed to help the adolescent change his homosexual orientation. Similar laws are on the books in other states. There is, as we speak, a movement afoot to make it illegal to offer such counseling to anyone, even to an adult who says, I'm a Christian, I have homosexual desires, I don't want these desires, can you help me? If current trends continue, it's entirely possible, in my opinion, very likely, that licensed therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists will not be able to offer such help to homosexual people who want it. A few years ago, the director of one of the largest ministries addressing homosexuality made a public apology to the gay community and said, I am sorry we have promised you change. I am sorry we have told you you should change. We are now shutting our doors. There is a growing consensus, even among many Bible-believing Christians, that we should recognize homosexuality as something unchangeable and thereby relax our particular standards on the issues, all based on the notion that homosexuality must be immutable. As always, we can challenge both the accuracy and the implication. Let's start with the accuracy. And that goes back to Paul, to Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 6. When he was really getting on the Corinthians about their general carnality and talking to them about the contrast between believers and non-believers, he said, don't you know the unrighteous, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. Do not kid yourselves. Do not be deceived. Neither adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, idolaters, thieves, revilers, homosexuals, or prostitutes shall inherit the kingdom. It's a very broad, very concise statement. And then he made a remarkable statement, one obviously I take to heart when he said, and such were, past tense, some of you. He said, I know I'm writing a letter to a church in which there are former homosexuals and former prostitutes and former idolaters and former fornicators and everything else. Such were some of you, past tense. What did he mean when he said such were some of you? Did he mean that you have been through an experience that microwaved you out of any sinful temptation and now you no longer have it? Or did he mean you have stopped the temptation or you've stopped the behavior but still have the temptation every day or something in between? Strictly speaking, when we repent of sin, we are not guaranteed relief from the temptation to the sin. We are guaranteed relief from the power of the sin. This, to me, is the critical foundational issue. I will concede that when people repent of any sin, because the flesh is still intact, the old nature is still there, and the sin resides in the old nature, the individual is very likely to continue to have temptations towards that sin. Does that mean the individual did not change? That's where you can first challenge the accuracy of the claim. You might try, if you're interested in this subject, looking up a website called NARTH, National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. It's a clinical website, and in it you'll find not only testimonials, but some very valid studies on what sort of changes have been experienced from pe on the part of people who said, I have homosexual desires, I don't want them, to what extent can I experience relief from these desires? There was a time it wasn't radical for psychiatrists or psychologists to hold the viewpoint that those desires could be overcome. But since homosexuality was normalized by the American Psychiatric Association in 1973, there's been a growing movement 
to hold a uniform viewpoint in clinical circles on homosexuality and see it as something both natural and something unchangeable. Also, uh, an excellent book by Mark Yarhouse and Stanton Jones called Ex Gays, you can find that on Amazon.com, um, is a longitudinal study on individuals who repented of homosexuality and the types of changes that they experienced. I would propose that our definition of change is really what needs to be clarified when we talk about whether or not somebody can change. Let me say right off the bat, when I repented of homosexuality, I was not looking at change as an issue. I needed to turn from that sin. I didn't know if I'd ever be relieved of the temptation towards it or if I'd live a celibate life or what was going to become of me. I only knew that the thing was wrong. That's where it had to begin. But if there is a change in behavior, if an individual's behavior has changed, has the person changed? Well, yes, of course. My gosh, you have an alcoholic who has been alcoholic for 40 years of his life. He stops drinking. He goes sober. Ten years later, he still craves alcohol, but he's never touched a drop. Did he change? Of course he did. Are you kidding? Everything in his life probably changed when he went sober. All the damage the drinking was doing stopped. The way he relates, the way he functions, everything changed because he stopped that behavior. He changed. If that's the only change he experienced, he changed. Change in behavior. Change in identity. This, to me, is also a critical point. When I repented of homosexuality, there was a significant shift in the way I saw myself. I no longer saw myself through the lens of my sexual feelings. I saw myself in broader terms. I'm a male. I live according to God's will. I'm a committed follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. And of course, a change in identity is a significant change. I also find among many people who repent of homosexual behavior, they experience something I experienced, which was a change in the frequency and the intensity of the homosexual attractions. That was not something I could make happen. It was simply something that happened. As I consistently resisted attractions when they came up and refused to feed them, whether in fantasy or through porn, certainly through acting on them, I found that more and more time would go by between those attractions and that when they arose, they were not as powerful as they were before. And this to me speaks of the difference between the presence of sin and the power of sin. I still retain a sin nature. I enjoy a normal relationship with my wife, who I am very specifically physically attracted to. If I had not experienced sexual desire for her, I would have never married her. I don't believe in marrying someone on faith. I married her because I felt all that I believe a man should feel for a woman if he is to marry her. So the capacity for heterosexual arousal was there, which I had not appreciated before, but it was definitely there. I could, under certain circumstances, be strongly pulled back towards homosexuality. And I am aware of what those circumstances are. So for obvious reasons, I avoid such circumstances. I could not, for example, go witnessing at a gay pride parade where people are often running around half naked and there's a very erotically charged environment. There's certainly nothing wrong with witnessing at a gay pride parade. I think that's a fine thing to do. It wouldn't be for me. I would not do evangelism in a gay bar. I think that would be very foolish. Anything wrong with doing evangelism in a gay bar? No, actually there is not. It wouldn't be right for me. I would never work out at a gym where there was sexual activity going on between the men in the steam room or some such thing. I, I could not be in that environment without probably feeling some pull and arousal and temptation. Well, if I was completely delivered from any capacity for homosexuality, those things would not be issues to me, but they are. And since I realize they are, I 
obviously have no intention of finding out to what extent they would pull me. I just appreciate the fact that they could and thereby I choose not to put myself in a position where I would be compromised. All of which is to say, if somebody was 200 pounds overweight and they lost 180 pounds, did they change? Oh, goodness, of course they did. Could they still lose more? Yeah. Could I still be more free, more delivered, more holy in all parts of my life? Yeah, I, yeah, I certainly could. But that doesn't mean a change didn't happen. More often than not, you will find when someone is arguing the change issue, they frame it in all or nothing terms. If someone did not lose all homosexual attractions, they therefore did not change at all. And there are times Christians go to the other extreme and also demand that if you repent of homosexuality, you must have lost all homosexual temptations or else you never really repented, which, by the way, has kept many people within the body of Christ feeling terrified to admit their temptations because they feel like, wow, if anybody knew I have these temptations, even though I never act on them, and by the grace of God I resist them, people would think horribly of me just because that's a temptation in my life, which is a shame. Because really it somehow elevates homosexuality into a special sin status and causes many believers within the body to feel they have to go elsewhere to be honest about their temptations, and that's a setup for all kinds of tragedy. So we can challenge the accuracy of the claim, both in natural terms based on research on the possibility of change, and by challenging the definition of change. Perhaps more important, we can challenge the implication of the argument, though, and this is an important point. As with the inborn theory, we do not determine the rightness or wrongness of something by how deeply ingrained it is, nor even by whether or not somebody can lose all temptation towards it. Because most believers will admit that while God transforms us and the Spirit sanctifies us and we are absolutely changed from glory to glory, we retain in many ways desires that we could default to if we choose to. That's a reality of, of Christian living. And so, bringing it down to this issue, I have known people who repented of homosexual behavior and renounced a homosexual identity. They don't lie about what they experience. They don't say, I never have homosexual temptations. They just say, I don't call myself gay or homosexual. I call myself a Christian who at times has homosexual temptations along with many other types of temptations. You know. I've known some who made that decision and never felt a heterosexual response to anyone. And they live celibate lives, Christ-centered lives, godly lives, but they have not moved into marriage. They're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> they didn't fall short in some way. It's not a lack of faith. It's not because they didn't have the right counselor or follow the right formula. For whatever reason, they are allowed to continue to wrestle with same-sex attractions. They resist by the grace of God and to live celibate lives. Other people experience very significant relief from their homosexual temptations and experience specific heterosexual arousal. And some people experience both. Some experience heterosexual arousal, but still wrestle with very regular homosexual temptations, which they say no to. And all really would constitute change in some way. Change in behavior, change in identity, certainly change in the way one responds to the temptations when they come up. These are all very valid forms of change. What we would not do is say, if you, lose the desire, if you don't lose the desire to do something, you therefore should resign yourself to doing it. Can you imagine the moral anarchy in the church if we applied that ethic across the board? How many of us would default to our tendency to gossip or to overeat or to get drunk or to punch somebody out or to flake out and never go to work, or who knows what, you know. And this is, again, where I see the difference between the presence of sin and the power of sin. 
The presence of sin is guaranteed. So John said, if you say you have no sin, you're kidding yourself. Paul told the Romans, though, sin shall not have dominion over you. Let's think about that for a minute. If sin had dominion over you, you couldn't say no to it. You yielded to it. It had you in bondage. And then by the grace of God, you renounced it. You walked away from it. And you still sometimes feel the temptation towards it, but it no longer holds you. Brother, sister, you changed. Of course you did. One of my favorite movies you might have seen is called A Beautiful Mind. Um, story of the mathematician Nash, John Nash. And uh, Nash, while brilliant, um, had a, a severe psychosis and literally saw and interacted with hallucinations, hallucinatory figures. In fact, the film is, spoiler alert, it's beautifully crafted. You, you go halfway through the movie before you realize that the people he's interacting with don't even exist. And then he has a crisis point where he realizes, well, these hallucinations are ruining my life. One was his roommate, one was an undercover agent, and one was a, a, a sweet little girl. And uh, at a critical part in the film, he does what we would call repentance, though he doesn't frame it that way, where he says to them, I am through with you. I must say goodbye to you. I cannot interact with you anymore. And for a while, all hell breaks loose. They interfere with his life. And and it's very hard for him not to interact with them, but with patience, he diligently avoids dealing with them. And the film ends many years later, about 20, 30 years later, when he's older. And he's very well managed his condition to the point where those hallucinations never interfere with his life anymore. Never. He lives a very high-functioning life. And a colleague asked him, do you ever have the hallucinations anymore? And at that point, Nash looks across the room, and way on the other side of the room against the wall, he sees the three hallucinations just standing there quietly looking at him. <laughs> and he says to his colleague, yeah, I do. But they don't rule my life anymore. I don't have to interact with them. I don't have to deal with them. That's change. The presence is still there. The power of it is no longer there. Which is why I find it fruitless to get into headbutting with homosexual people over whether or not they can truly change to the point where they never again have a temptation in a particular area. Because what I like to point out is immutable does not mean normal or God-ordained because there are many conditions that seem quite permanent and immutable. Addictive desires, depression, violent desires, deeply ingrained habits. That is the power of the flesh. And making it even more personal, if I may. Those first couple of years after I repented were, in some ways, two of the hardest years of my life. And in some ways, I miss them because there was a newness about it all that was so wonderful. And while I am grateful not to wrestle with the temptations as I used to, I'm aware under what circumstance they could be stirred up, but apart from that, they have no place in my life. When they were strong, every time I said no to them, it was an act of love. In that same chapter in Romans 5, when Paul says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you, he also makes a, a, a wonderful um, point or admonition when he says, as sin used to reign in your members, so now yield your members as instruments of righteousness. And this I keep in mind for any temptation. Every time I want to do something which would take me outside of God's will. When I say no to that, it's an act of worship. When we worship, we yield our bodies to God's purposes. That's what we did tonight, isn't it? With our hands and our mouths and our minds and our hearts, we yielded our bodies to God's purposes. When you say no to a temptation which would take you outside of God's will, 
you are yielding your body to God's purposes and thereby every temptation resisted becomes, becomes an act of worship and an act of love. And it was profoundly meaningful to me. Brought the Lord and I much closer. When I would say, Lord, I really want that. I want that fantasy. I want to look. I want to lust. But I love you. I'm yielding my body to your purposes. That The bonds solidified between us were very strong. For that reason, I, I would never say to the person who never loses temptations, oh, you must either be less spiritual or you did it wrong or there's something foundationally wrong with you. No, I would just say, praise God, you are able to love God by saying no to those temptations as I must love God by saying no to the temptations in my life as they come up. Immutable then does not mean normal nor God-ordained. Now a third common argument you'll hear is that if you object to homosexuality, your objection is based on what is called homophobia. That is to say, you don't just have a moral belief, you have a phobic condition. You can first challenge the accuracy of the claim because the term linguistically doesn't make sense, really. Homo means same. Phobia means a dread or a fear of an object or an experience or a person. So homophobia literally would mean a dread or a fear of the same, which linguistically makes no sense at all. But more important, you can challenge the implication of the term. The term homophobia suggests that if I believe homosexuality is wrong, I have a phobic response to homosexual people. Now, if you know anything about phobias, you know they are very pronounced. If you have arachnophobia, you have a dread of spiders. If you have claustrophobia, you dread close spaces. And, and I don't mean just, I don't like crowded elevators, and I do like spiders, but I'm not, I, you know, I wouldn't take one into my kitchen and get out alive after my wife found me, so I, you know. But I mean a real phobic response, break out into sweat and shake, and, ah, you know, that's phobia. When I'm talking to a homosexual and he says you're homophobic, I point out, I'm talking to you. Did you ever see an arachnophobe having a conversation with a spider? <laughs> if I'm homophobic, why aren't I breaking out in sweat? Why aren't I shaking? Why aren't I going, eek, a homosexual and running away? No, I, this is... You can challenge the accuracy and you can challenge the implication. This, to me, is relevant today. The implication being a moral objection is a form of prejudice or hatred. And let us not kid ourselves about this. We are living in times when moral objections have been redefined to mean hatred. Many people listening to the conversation you and I have had tonight would and probably will classify this as a hate rally. This was hateful speech coming from a hateful person, all because we hold a moral position which poses a disagreement to a certain behavior. The implication being, you cannot hold a moral position without being prejudiced. Now, a prejudice is, in fact, an ignorant belief in the superiority of one person over another. Are there people who have prejudice towards homosexuals? Yeah. There are. Always have been, always will be. There are people who do believe they are essentially better because they are heterosexual than homosexual people are. And they genuinely look down on homosexual people and they have a genuine prejudice towards homosexuals. That is true. That is true. But there is also conviction, which is a deeply held belief based on a worldview. That is to say... One can recognize another person as being of equal worth and have a genuine fondness and respect for that person and still hold a conviction based on worldview that that person's behavior is wrong. There are times I appeal to the maturity of the person I'm talking with and say, 
Don't you see how childish and irrational it is for us to say we hate each other simply because we disagree? If nothing else, it devalues the power of the term hatred. If I hate you, surely I will show it with something more vehement than me simply saying, I think you are wrong. So, there is phobia, which is very rare, a phobic response to homosexuals. There is prejudice against homosexuals, which some have. By and large, the traditionalist believer simply feels that homosexuality falls short of what God intended. Now, I do find it helpful always to broaden that statement to clarify I believe there are many behaviors falling short of what God intended, and millions of people engage in those behaviors. I believe the use of pornography falls short of what God intended. I believe adultery and sex before marriage falls short of what God intended, as does prostitution and strip clubs and massage parlors and homosexuality. So there are many behaviors I believe fall short of what God intended. And by the way, every day I commit behaviors falling short of what God intended. And every day I have thoughts falling short of what God intended. This is the nature of sin. And I find it, again, in discussion very helpful to bring that in to clarify I'm, I'm not obsessing over nor elevating this to a special status. Now that will often lead the person to object for the next argument, which is, well, come on. You keep saying it's a sin, but don't you know Jesus never said anything about homosexuality? Never said a word about it. And if Jesus never said anything about it, he must be okay with it. And if he's okay with it, why aren't you? Now you can challenge both the accuracy and the implication of that statement. You can challenge the accuracy of it because nobody can with integrity say, I know Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Nor can I with any integrity say, I know Jesus specifically did say something about homosexuality. Neither of us can say that. Why? Because the Gospels are not exhaustive. We simply don't have a written account of everything Jesus said. John said, John 21, 25, hey, there are many other things Jesus did, and I suppose if they were written, all the books could not contain them, all the books in the world. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't even pretend to be some sort of camcorder which followed Jesus through life and took down everything he said. So it's entirely possible he preached a whole sermon against homosexuality. For what it's worth, and it's not worth much, my opinion is he probably didn't, but I, you know, he could have and we wouldn't have a record of it. The question becomes, if Jesus did not condemn a specific behavior, does that mean the behavior is not condemned? Well, now surely that can't be true. Let's look first at what Jesus did say. I quoted this earlier when he spoke to created intent. Matthew 19, 4 to 6, when he said, this is what God intended. Don't you know he created the male and female? A man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, they become one flesh, and so forth. That was a very important positioning statement, because what did he say? I, God incarnate, am telling you that the creator's original intention for the sexual union was this. And from that positioning statement, we know anything falling short of that would be the definition of sin. You can also challenge the implication because the Gospels are not the entire canon. There is something in that argument which implies that everything we need to know about Christianity we can get from Jesus' specific words recorded in the Gospels. In fact, you may have heard of a whole group of people who call themselves red-letter Christians who believe that the teachings of Jesus somehow take precedence over the rest of Scripture. And while I can somewhat see why people could come to that conclusion, the reality is it diminishes the authority of all of Scripture. 
which Paul told Timothy is inspired in its entirety. All of it is profitable for what doctrine, reproof, instruction in righteousness, and so forth. If we were to limit our source of learning from the teachings of Christ, we would have no need of all of the books of history and poetry and prophecy in the Old Testament, nor would we have need of the recording of church history and of the epistles and the revelation, all of which, of course, are equally authoritative. Besides all of which, let's point out the obvious, which I'll bet you've already thought of. What else did Jesus not say anything about? A heck of a lot. We have no record, for example, of Jesus condemning incest. Not specifically. Not specifically. We have no specific instance in the Gospels of him uh, condemning bestiality or technically even condemning spousal abuse. Now, is anybody really going to argue that those behaviors could be legitimate just because Jesus did not name them? Of course not. Which leads to a concluding argument, and we'll leave it at this for tonight. And you will often hear this. You Christians are wrong again. You've been wrong about so many things. You were all wrong about civil rights. You were all wrong about the witches in Salem. You were all wrong about the Holocaust. You've been wrong about so many things. And because you've been wrong about so many things in the past... Obviously, you're wrong about this. The church has been wrong in the past. You're going to challenge the accuracy of that argument? Well, not entirely, no. I'd, I'd concede the accuracy to a point. I will concede that many Christians at different times in human history have collectively been wrong about key issues. That is true. Many Christians supported the buying and selling of other human beings. Now, clearly, all Christians did not. And it's easily verifiable that the abolitionist movement, in fact, was largely Christian-inspired and Christian-supported. If Christians didn't participate in the abolitionist movement, I dare say it wouldn't have even happened. But yes, many believers did support the practice of slavery. That is true. Many Christians were wrong about civil rights in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s. Not all Christians, not by any means. Good heavens, the civil rights movement, as with the abolitionist movement, was largely fueled by a Christian influence. But yes, many believers did error misinterpreting Scripture to legitimize racial discrimination. It's horrible to consider, but it's true. There were Christians who went along with Hitler. There were Christians who legitimized the annihilation of Jewish people. Then again, the underground movement resisting Hitler was largely fueled by Christian influence, most noteworthy by people like Corrie ten Boom and other saints who very courageously resisted um, Nazism. But yeah, there are times the church, at least segments of it, have been wrong. Not the whole church, that would be inaccurate to say. Some. Now the question becomes this. If you have ever been wrong, can you therefore never be right? Because if that's so, you can never be right about anything, can you? So when a gay person says to me, well, Christians have been wrong in the past, I, I would say, yes, and your point is, <laughs> have you ever been wrong in the past? Well, sure I have. Well, then, that doesn't mean you're wrong in the present. So errors in past positions do not prove errors in current positions. Now, oftentimes the errors have been in the methods of holding or promoting the position. This I will say with huge regret and some vehemence, many Christians have had the right position on homosexuality and have expressed it in all the wrong ways. This is true. When I was a gay activist, we carefully monitored 
what well-known pastors and televangelists and preachers said about homosexuality. We collected many statements that were, by any reasonable standards, very spiteful, mean-spirited, inaccurate, sometimes downright hateful. And may I say plainly, we loved that. Because every time Christians said something inaccurate or stupid or hateful about us, we could tell ourselves, you see, we're right and they're wrong. So yes, there are those who have had the right position but held it or expressed it in the wrong way. But does that mean the position itself was wrong? Well, of course not. Now, I think, for example, about Puritan times when certain positions were held, positions I agree with, but I don't agree with the way they were enforced. So, for example, the, 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 the Puritans held the position that you should go to church. I, I, yes, I think you should. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, if you missed church and you didn't have a good reason, you know, like you died, why, you might find yourself in the stocks next week. I can't really get behind that. If you gossiped, I believe the church held the right position, don't gossip. But if you did, you might find yourself tied to a stool, attached to a pole, swung out over the lake and dunked underwater and held there for a minute while the whole town laughed at you. Don't agree with that at all, but I agree with the position. Likewise, yes, Christians may have expressed the right position in the wrong way, but errors in expressing a position do not prove the error of the position itself. The bottom line question is, what is the right position? Not how poorly or how well have people expressed that position. All of which brings us back to the threefold challenge we'll keep addressing tomorrow when we do our sessions on the pro gay interpretation of the Bible and what to do when homosexuality hits home. This subject challenges us to know the word, to know the issues, and then apply the word to the issues. Let's take a minute now and. Um, I'm going to ask the ushers if we could pick up whatever questions anybody has written down, and I will try to answer them as succinctly as possible and, and get us out of here before this turns into a sleepover. Uh, <laughs> so if you do have a question that you've written down on an index card, would you raise your hand so they will know to uh, pick it up from you? And then after I finish that up, we'll close with some worship and call it a night. Is Beg your pardon? I know Pastor David Hawking. Well, there will be no living with me now. <laughs> you always get a little on edge when somebody says, do you know who you remind me of? And I think, oh, <laughs> please, you're not going to say Donald Duck, are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> David Hawking, I'll take that one. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? No. No. Well, let me start anyway, just in the interest of moving this along. <clears throat> what would you say to a church that believes in loving all people but are not supportive of a change ministry? Well, I, I think it would depend on how you define, quote-unquote, a change ministry. Number one, I believe if a church is Bible-believing and functioning in body ministry, it need not have any specific kind of ministry. It doesn't have to have a ministry to people dealing with drugs or overeating or smoking or emotional problems. Uh, so I certainly don't think a church needs to have a specific specialized ministry addressing this in order to effectively address it. 
In fact, to put it more plainly, when I was attending Calvary Chapel between 1984 and I'd say about 1988 or 89 out in Costa Mesa, there was no specialized ministry there dealing with homosexuality, but I was getting the word, I was getting great fellowship, I was getting body ministry. Those are the nutrients we need. I believe in specialized ministry. I run a specialized ministry, so obviously I believe in them, but they are supplements. If you're going to be healthy, you have to first have a healthy diet. Then in addition to that, you want to take some extra protein, vitamin B or C, fine. But those are supplements. They don't replace the actual meal. The same is true of specialized ministries. So um, I, I am a little apprehensive of the term change ministry because it implies that um, uh, it's a sort of presto changeo kind of ministry that will, as some people say, pray the gay away. I like the concept of a discipleship ministry where we're basically saying we're coming together to be accountable to each other, studying the word together, praying together, confessing to each other, and holding each other accountable to be better disciples and to be better stewards of our bodies and our sexuality, however that stewardship might play out. In your experience, what has been the most effective way of dealing with homosexuals? Nothing will beat the combination of compassion and conviction. Conviction speaks truth plainly. Compassion shows respect and love for the individual. The late Francis Schaeffer said that the, the great challenge of the church is keeping the balance between compassion and conviction. When we keep that intact, that, that is the most effective way of dealing with anyone, including homosexuals. My concern is for the younger generation and kids. They are being or have been brainwashed. In your opinion, is there a role in the church for age-appropriate teaching on this topic in the 4th through 12th grade? A absolutely, yes. Yes, there is. Now, um, age-appropriate being the operative phrase, but let's figure that our kids are being talked to about this issue. I would rather they hear about it from us. From a biblical perspective, we can teach our children from early in life that they are created, that their bodies are sacred, that they at times, like all people, will feel desires to step outside of God's will and misuse their bodies, and that God will give them the grace to resist those temptations. Then as they approach their teens, we can teach them that they will know many people whose temptations are homosexual. And we love and respect homosexual people, but this is why we believe that falls short of God's will. In fact, I really believe we're about 20 years behind the mark in teaching our young people about this. I really do. It's not only that we need to teach them what Scripture says about being good stewards of their body and what Scripture says about homosexuality, but we really do need to be training them more as future apologists who will be able to articulate the Christian viewpoint and reason with people. So I do believe that, yes, the, the, we have a mandate, really, to be speaking to them about this. What is the reason young people are exploring um, binary gender? Um, I think I get to point. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite reading the, the handwriting, but non-binary gender, uh, the, the concept of Gender is irrelevant, I'm neither male nor female, or I'm a combination of both, and so forth. Um, now, I, I said earlier, and I, I want to reiterate this, I don't like to get into a lot of devil chasing, I really don't. I do not think we should look to Satan as the answer for all of the problems that we're having in the world. However, it's impossible to not recognize why the enemy of humanity would want to dismantle the most exquisite things God created. The creation of the male-female binary is one of the most complex and really one of the most beautiful of all uh, created concepts and experiences. And the greatest honor that could be bestowed on any relationship is bestowed on the male-female union. In the Old Testament, it is a type of God's relationship to his people, in the New Testament, it is a type of Christ's relationship to his church. That means it is sacred. It is sacred. And uh, I think the goal 
of the enemy of humanity has been to first dismantle the sacredness of monogamy and permanence. Thus, we introduce no-fault divorce and the sexual revolution. Then to dismantle the notion of sexual normality as being a male-female component or unit, the gay rights movement. Now we have the blurring even of the gender lines, the transgender movement. So I do think that this is a trajectory towards ultimate dehumanizing of uh, what, what we are, what we are meant to be, I should say a devaluing more than a dehumanizing. And I shudder thinking of where all this is going, truly. Uh, but I think we can argue that we are advocates for the contrast between male and female, which God created in response to the deepest human need, and that there is a complexity to that. In fact, I would argue at times that it is very sexist to say that there is no distinction and therefore no particular value to that. There are qualities giftings, perceptions, capacities my wife has, I could never have. I could say I identify as Renee. I could say I think I am Renee. I could say I want to be Renee, but it would be a terrible insult to Renee if I took this big, bald-headed, hairy body and tried to transplant it into her and say, I am now there by Renee. Because I could never bring to the table what my wife could bring to the table. And with all due modesty, I hope she could never bring to the table what I could bring to as a male. Because those distinctions are divinely designed. And because they are divinely designed anatomically and psychologically, I think trying to blur those distinctions is a way of devaluing both women and men. So the long and short of it is that is my take on the concept of, uh, of uh, devaluing gender. Your argument, well, what argument is there against non-Christian homosexuals? There is not so much an argument against non-Christian homosexuals any more than there is an argument against non-Christian gamblers or non-Christian thieves or you know, non-Christian uh, overeaters. I mean, I, I, my biggest concern about a non-Christian is that they are non-Christian, not that they're homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. They are unsaved, and because they are unsaved, that is my concern. That said, I will also say I do believe that even in the natural, the homosexual who accepts that as a way of life and a way of being is accepting something which in the natural I do not believe is ever going to deliver what a heterosexual union could deliver. So I do think that Christian principles, even when they're lived out by non-Christians, are in the non-Christians' best interest. But I must take a cue from what Paul told the Corinthian church when he said, hey, I told you not to keep company with fornicators, but I didn't mean fornicators of the world, otherwise you'd have to go out of the world. And then he said, what have I to do to judge those who are on the outside? Those who are on the outside, God judges. And so I am not interested in persuading the non-Christian homosexual to abandon homosexuality. I'm interested in persuading him or her to receive Jesus Christ. Then we can talk about proper stewardship. Have been asked, are gays going to heaven? I don't mean to mince words or play word games, but I do have to point out a lot of that depends on what you mean by gays. If a person has been born again and wrestles with temptations towards homosexuality and is not yielding to those temptations, is that person going to heaven? Yeah, of course I think that person is. If a person is born again and backslides into homosexual sin, is that person going to heaven? I don't know. I know that ultimately, Paul said, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom. Does that mean that in this life they cross a line and lose their salvation? Or does it mean that if they die in that sin, they're lost forever? That I do not know. I tend to think that someone who does what I did 
is probably very deceived and in rebellion and in a very dangerous place. Whether or not they have lost their salvation, I don't know. Um, if you mean people who are gay and are not Christian don't go to heaven, I would say, yes, they don't go to heaven, but it's not because they're gay. It's because they haven't been born again. So I think that's really where the central theme should be. Have they or have they not been born again? I will let the Arminius and the Calvinists duke it out as to whether or not you can lose your salvation. Not going there. And I'll be very honest, I don't know. That's just, and I defer completely to your pastor on that one. I really... I'm not comfortable landing strongly on a position saying, do whatever you want, it's, it's going to be fine, you'll still get into heaven. There are some scriptures that warn, I believe, against having a casual attitude towards your salvation in that way. However, I will also say this, if my repenting of sexual sin sure as heck wasn't my idea, God did that. God gave me the will to repent. God gave me the enlightenment to repent. God gave me the sustenance to repent. To what extent my free will in, came into it, I will probably never know. Probably never will. Which didn't answer your question at all, did it? I'm sorry. That's the best I can do. Um, in regards to Matthew 19, 4 to 6, one friend asked, why does this passage have so much relevance in regard to homosexuality when there are contradictions in the Bible? You know, I, I so often hear that question, and I'll bet many of you do too. Well, why? There are so many contradictions in the Bible, and you say, okay, uh, which one? And you get the deer in the headlights. And so I'm not, this question is based on the premise that there are contradictions in the Bible, which is a premise I'm not really willing to accept. I will say this, though. Um, those of us who are traditionalists, and I trust that's most, if not all of us, we don't tend to base our position on homosexuality just on one verse. Although one verse would be enough to base a position on. There are five verses, uh, two in the Old Testament, three in the New, specifically condemning homosexual behavior. Then there is the creation account in which God clarified what he intended the sexual union to be. There's Jesus' reiteration of the creation account. And there is the fact, as I hope to point out tomorrow, that throughout Scripture, the only form of sexual union consistently praised is a heterosexual monogamous union. So for those reasons, we believe that homosexuality is wrong. It's not just pulled out of Matthew 19, although that's certainly part of it. You may address it tomorrow, but how to deal with a daughter who is gay. Yes, we will be talking about that at length tomorrow, so please uh, be sure you're here for the session when homosexuality hits home. Would you be a groomsman in a homosexual wedding? No, I... I could not in good conscience attend a same-sex wedding. This will be an issue uh, Christians are going to face. Uh, two big challenges we'll have at a very practical level. Many of you will be invited to same-sex weddings. And some, perhaps many of you, will have transsexual friends who will change or attempt to change their sex and will ask you to address them by the name of the sex they have chosen. They will want you to um, verbalize that affirmation. In my opinion, I could not in good conscience do either as a believer, and I realize that's going to create tremendous tensions, but I think uh, regarding a same-sex wedding, I don't think it's possible to attend a wedding without by your presence saying, I bless this, I support it. In fact, many of you will remember a time when um, in, in, in marriage ceremonies, the people in attendance were asked, okay, anybody have any objections? Speak now or forever hold your peace. And if you don't have objections, you're saying, I bless this, I condone it, I'm, I'm with it. It's not, I could go to a party that gay people threw. I could, I could go have dinner with gay people. I could hang out with gay people. That's, that's very different. But to attend a wedding, in my opinion, um, is the same as saying, I bless this by my presence. For the same reason, if a friend of mine dumped his wife for a younger model and married the younger woman, I couldn't go. If a friend of mine married a non-believer, the friend was a Christian and is being unequally yoked, I couldn't stand there and say, yes, I bless this, I'm all for it. I, I just couldn't, so... For the, all of those reasons, I would say 
No, I could not participate in any way, not even by attendance. By the way, um, there are responsible, good Christian teachers and leaders who would disagree with me. So, but in all fairness, uh, this is perhaps a conscience issue. I, I really feel pretty settled in my position on it, but there are people I respect very much, biblically, you know, well-grounded, astute people who would say under some circumstances it may be allowable if you feel led to go to go to a same-sex wedding. I disagree, and I think there will have to be room for disagreement on that. Uh, what would you say to someone struggling with the shame that, cause, that comes with being attracted to the same sex? It's not shame from God, um, but society or self-hatred. Well, I, I would say I fully get that. I, I felt that myself, and it's nothing to sneer at. When you feel as though your particular sin is one that if everybody knew it, they'd think you're a freak or a sissy or a queer or a faggot or, you know, whatever, demeaning thing. You have what I would call an unhealthy shame. Shame's not a dirty word. There's, you know, Paul told the Corinthian church at least once, I'm saying this to your shame. Shame on you, you know. So there's, there's good, there's good things, good reasons to be ashamed. But the nature of a temptation is not, in my opinion, something to be legitimately ashamed of. And I think something I had to face was I have a conviction of this sin in my life, but I also have an inordinate belief deeply ingrained from years of shame that this makes me somehow less valuable than other men. And I, I think that a combination of prayer healthy interaction, studying what Scripture says about our value before God, and daring to kind of let Christ speak to you like he did on the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. And you embrace that, and you walk in it, and, and uh, you find that more and more you're released from that. But it's no small thing. Uh, this was another question, should a Christian go to a gay wedding, which, again, I've, I've answered. <clears throat> when questioning the Christian viewpoint on homosexuals, others will attack how a Christian picks and chooses which verses to follow. They often refer to obscure requirements from Leviticus. How do you answer these people? Thank you for the question. We will very specifically go over that tomorrow when we review Leviticus on the pro-gay theology. So if you will, please let me answer that in more detail tomorrow. We will get into that very question. What causes some gays to exhibit characteristics of the opposite sex? Guys who act and sound like females and vice versa. I really don't know. Uh, I don't. I know that uh, some people seem more, um, some males seem more feminine even from early in life, probably a lack of hormonalization even in the womb could have created that. Some people adopt mannerisms of the opposite sex for a number of reasons. I don't think there is any one reason uh, that that happens. Um, I think part of our challenge is to make a distinction, though, between biblical versus non-biblical <clears throat> concepts of masculinity and femininity. Uh, I am not at all in favor of the denigration of stereotypical masculinity. Um, I still think John Wayne is a larger-than-life heroic figure, <laughs> and nobody touches my John Wayne movies. Uh, you know, I, and, and I think there's much to be said for that sort of hearty, simplistic view that we have had. But I think we also can... Um, apply it inaccurately or even unfairly. Because to me, if a man keeps his word, keeps his commitments, is disciplined, has vision and purpose, and is responsible in his relationships, he's a stud. Now, I don't know how deep his voice is, nor do I care. I don't care how big his chest is. And if he seems stereotypically effeminate in 
gestures or voice or posture, I still say he's a stud. Because to my thinking, masculinity is about initiative and structure and follow through and core strength. There is a nurturing quality to femininity, grace, and mystery. Can a woman be a tomboy and have all of that? Of course she can. So again, I think if we, if we make the mistake of thinking people are of better character because they fit into stereotypical expressions of masculinity and femininity, I don't think we're operating out of a biblical mindset. Uh, how do I get, last question, how do I get past or ignore the missing of my old gay friends? They meant so much to me, and it's hard to not miss them and to walk away fully. Yes, it is. Um, I, first of all, really deeply respect and appreciate the question. I had to do the same. Now, I, let me say quickly, I don't believe if you repent of homosexuality, you have to cut off all your old gay friends. I don't believe that. In my case, I had to relocate, and in my case, because I declared myself to my gay friends. And I said, you know, I've, <clears throat> I, I really see this as a sin now. I'm not trying to judge you, but I, I think it's wrong. Well, that alone terminated a lot of my friendships for obvious reasons. Not all of them, though, really. I mean, some of my gay friends were very reasonable and fair-minded and... You know, um, when I started doing the kind of work I do, I think that was the last straw. But, uh, I, but I do know this. Um, in conscience, I also realized that e even if I was not attracted to or stumbled by gay friends, if being around them caused me to be less watchful over myself, that was problematic and I would have to withdraw. And I'm assuming that has something to do with your question. And it, it feels like death. I mean, many of us who've repented of this sin walked away from our primary support structure where we were well known and felt very solidified. And then we may come into the church and through no fault of the church necessarily, but it just takes a while to get acclimated, make close friends and feel plugged in. And there's a sense of, oh, Where's my community? Where's the people I was so bonded to? Besides all of which, I missed, and to this day still miss, some of my gay friends because some of them were just flat out wonderful people, you know? And I, I think part of what we have to do is recognize the high price we pay, which is well worth it, of sanctification of any sort is we oftentimes say no to things that we grieve, and there is nothing wrong with that grief. I think if we need to weep over it, we weep over it. I think we need to recognize it. Then as much as possible, we try to work around it by forming the healthiest intimate relationships we can within the body and functioning as best as we can. I think to a point, we will always feel a loss if we have had to say goodbye to people out of obedience to God, and I see nothing wrong with that. The great sin comes in looking back, not in missing the individual, but if we start to covet the sin itself in the interest of being with the people, then of course we have a problem we have to recognize as a problem. All right, thank you very much for the questions. We'll meet again tomorrow. Thanks so much. God bless you.